actually got involved in a lot of nonviolent civil disobedience work uh, later in high school and then in college. And I worked on a lot of causes and uh, I studied um, nonviolent, like all, I mean, there was no one more prolific in terms of writing than Gandhi, but start, studied a lot of other theorists in college and really felt like um, this was something me and my views could use and learn from on the left because I was on the streets and we were protesting and locking ourselves to buildings and, and uh, you know, causing a big scene outside of the White House or outside of, I was a vegetarian, I'm still a vegetarian, but we had a protest outside the circus where there was animal abuses and, and locked, locked, I locked myself in the center of a three ring, three ring circus by the neck. And I remember when I locked myself by the neck, this was one of the first arrests, I was pretty young, and there's thousands of people coming to the circus. And I remember at that moment, once we were locked, the keys were thrown away. I wasn't going anywhere. And I turned to the six or seven people locked with me. And I thought, we're ruining these children's nights. And that for the first time was dissonance in my head that not every tactic and strategy there is, is the right thing for the right time. There hadn't been education. Those folks didn't know why we were there. There were kids who had no say that were really just coming for a night of entertainment. Their parents might not have known better. And that's when I got really, really into the idea of escalation of tactics that you really have to start at the first part, which is a conversation, which is really understanding where each other is coming from, finding that common ground to talk about the common pain that we all share to move an issue forward. I actually started in college this conference, it was called the National Conference on Civil Disobedience, where I wanted to bridge academia with activism. Um, so I went with the Free Burma Coalition. A bunch of us went, we talked to people in Bangkok and then on the border regions in refugee camps. We actually crossed the border and spent some time inside the rebel camps of a lot of the ethnic minorities who had fled the city and were trying to protect their own land. We went in to Myanmar. We handed out very small leaflets. They're the size of business cards. And they said, we are your friends from around the world. We support your hopes for human rights and democracy. That's it. But in a military dictatorship, that is highly illegal. We didn't make our flight home. All 18 of us were arrested. I didn't know at the time. And we only spent about a week in jail. We had a sham trial. Um, we were sentenced to five years and then deported the next day. Now, of course, I didn't know any of this happening, but I knew enough. I had studied enough that fear wasn't an option in that moment, that I knew however long I was in there, I couldn't present fear no matter what I was feeling. I really had to stay grounded in the people I had met. I needed to stay confident in who I was and that this was something worth fighting for. The head of the Human Rights Commission in our Congress was a congressman named Chris Smith, who's from the state of New Jersey, and he's a Republican. And he flew all the way to Thailand to try to get us out. He used his power as a Republican, and you know, in the US, we're extremely divided. Um, Republicans and Democrats and me always being someone for social justice has always been far, far, far to the left. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe that somebody that identified as Republican was going to come across the country because he believed in us and he wanted us out. And he also had been speaking out against the human rights abuses in Myanmar for a long time. And I shared a plane ride with him home. And I remember thinking as a young activist, am I going to sit next to him and like question him on all the policies I disagree with? Should I talk to him about all of these things? And um, I didn't. I decided there was too much we had in common. And I spent the time talking about that, the human rights situations where we had common ground. I do think it's time for common ground. I think it's time to reach across the aisle, not so we can, you know, come up with a moderate solution, but reach across the aisle to the other people suffering who have different views than us. We're suffering from the same things, from a bad economy, from this divide and conquer and pitting each other against each other. We're all suffering from that, but we can't seem to bridge that divide. And so I think that's necessary. It's a turn it's a turn towards more human conversations than just resistance of the authoritarianism and racism of the last few years. 
We passed a historic piece of legislation, the First Step Act. It was the largest criminal justice reform legislation in generation. We've seen an 18% decrease in the federal prison population since uh, when I started and now. And that's huge. That's huge. 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 We haven't yeah. seen, we had been in a tough on crime, incarcerate everyone you can for a long time. And now we're seeing that decarceration because of that, that ability to work across the aisle, find common ground, and really keep the people in mind who need it most. The people who are locked away on these long sentences for no reason, how do we bring them home? I can't say it enough, hurt people hurt people. So I know, although our pain is not equal, I know that that white supremacist has something painful in their past. Something has hurt them to be able to hurt us. I know it. It might not be extreme, it's not an excuse. It's just a discovery. And I think if we can hang in the conversations and discover that, you can move all sorts of things.